Let me distribute the first homework. We have two problems. Actually, one, well, I shouldn't say two problems, but the first problem is sort of to derive certain quantities related to the news vendor problem, which is probably standard and it will be useful in refreshing your memories. You can find the results in, a, in, a, in any textbook. Uh, the results are there, but I want you to do the derivation so that you'll get used to doing it. The second question is a little bit uh, more difficult. It has sort of a multi-stage nature. You do something, you make a decision, and afterwards you make another decision, and you find out the effect of that uh, here. Okay, I think, yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. I don't think that it, it will be difficult, but at least I think it's going to be useful to refresh your memories. Okay, any questions on what we did on Tuesday? Okay, now I think it's time to move on with the paper. As I told you last time, I'm going to mention Eppen's 1979 paper today before I will start uh, the uh, inventor network design problem. Okay? Now, this is one of the, it, it's a very simple and straightforward paper for those of you who already have read it. It's not difficult to follow what's going on. And uh, the notions are nowadays, at least, it's very obviously known. So, uh, the idea is very simple. There is a distribution system. And in this distribution system, you have retailers. So let me show the retailers. And then there is a central warehouse, or I think it is, uh, Epen uses the word uh, it can be a distribution center. And then here we have different retailers. So the question here is, what is the way to control the inventory structure of this system where the customer demand comes to the retailers and the retailers may be of different size, but I am here sitting at the distribution center. So what is the best way of controlling inventories? So we are looking an answer to that question. Of course, in this paper, we are not going to be concerned with the transportation issues. This is simply an analysis on which we will try to understand the benefits of centralization. In other words, now we know that in practice, why do we have retailers? Why don't we all go and buy from distribution centers? Well, it turns out to be very inconvenient. Now, uh, think about uh, having a buckle simply on, on the next street versus having one supermarket in, uh, in let's say, Polatla. Okay, now everybody is going to go to Polatla, which is not going to be very meaningful. So convenience for the customers becomes very important after some point. So you want to have retailers in the system so that people will go to retailers and buy from the retailers rather than going to the distribution center. On the other hand, controlling the system, we are inclined to have less retailers so that everything will be more pulled together and so that we can make use of the economies of scale, largeness, operation costs, and so on and so forth. So what this simple note is going to tell us is very straightforward. Mathematically, it's going to show that if I can pull everything at the DC rather than uh, distributing everything to the retailers, if I can just keep all my stock at the DC, the service level that I will provide, given the same service level that I will provide, not considering the inconvenience, of course, then I need to have less stock to do that. Okay? Which is important in one aspect because basically it gives us the main motivation. Thinking that this is sort of something which came out almost uh, uh, th 30 years ago, 30, 35 years ago, it is important to understand mechanically 
what we mean by centralization. So Epen's paper in that respect is going to be an answer to this. Now we are going to assume that each retailer has a certain area, jurisdiction area, where the demand is going to be demand is going to have a mean of mu i and variance of sigma i square. So I'm going to assume that uh, the demand is given by xi, so xi is going to be a random variable, and I'm assuming that the mean and the, the, and the demand distribution follows a normal distribution. So it's, it's straightforward. Now, why normal? There might be a number of occasions where using normal is not meaningful, but normal is the distribution which is used almost 95% of the time because if you have an item that sells in considerable number of units, normal is a very reasonable approximation. Regardless, there might be better distributions, but I think it's very straightforward to use normal. Okay, so this is, this is the structure that I am given. Of course, there is something which is a little bit different, and that is the demand in this retailer is not going to be independent of the demand in the next retailer there might be some dependencies. In other words, uh, expected value of xi, well, let me rewrite this. There is a dependency between xi, xj are not independent. Of course, they may be independent if they are far away, but we assume that they are going to have some kind of a dependency. And I'm going to define sigma sub ij as the covariance term between i and j. And moreover, I'm going to define uh, rho sub ij as the correlation coefficient. Now, this correlation can be negative, positive. We don't know how it affects each other. OK, there might be certain locations where uh, the demand might be negatively correlated. In other words, if, if, uh, if, the, if retailer 1 sells more, the second retailer is expected to sell less because you have a limited population. Let us see this is what's happening if you have two retailers at uh, one of the places in, in Eskisheri, like Korusitesi. You have a limited population coming to there. Whereas if you have two locations, two retailers in Kızılay, they might positively affect each other. In other words, people would be coming there, so if one of them has large demand, you expect the other one to have large demand as well. Okay? So in that case, we are going to have positive correlation. You can see that there might be different circumstances which is going to result in different correlation structures. Now, of course, in order to make the demand, negative demand, probability of having negative demand negligible, we assume that sigma divided by mu i is reasonably small, and I would say that it is going to be less than 0 0.3. Now, in other words, if you have this larger than 0 0.3, this ratio, it turns out that the probability of having negative demand is going to be pretty large. Now, if you cannot follow what's going on, okay, Go and look at the normal distribution. Compute the probability of having negative values if standard deviation divided by mean ratio is greater than 0. Point, let's say 0. 0.4. Compute that, and you will see that it is going to be 5, 6, 7 percent. And if you have higher values, it will be more. It's not going to be very meaningful to use normal distribution in those cases, of course. Okay? So we expect this to be to be true in order to use the normal distribution. Okay, now this is basically uh, the givens. Now once we have those, next step is to model the system using news vendor uh, as an application uh, using news vendor type structure. In other words, what I will do is in the retailer, I'm going to every period Looking, I'm, I will look at the inventory, but I'm assuming that I will be selling a lot as well. So every period, I'm going to order a certain quantity so that the, uh, the 
inventory level in a retailer is going to be at a certain uh, position. Okay? So I'm assuming that uh, lead time is basically negligible and I'm only interested in total stock which is kept as safety in the system. We're going to talk about more detailed, better models, but this is first of a very uh, rough cut analysis of the distribution system. So what, I, what do I mean by news vendor is that if you have the same problem every period and if you think that you are going to sell, so you will never be selling zero units in a given period, so you are going to order up to the same level every period. So this is what's, what's happening. So in order to find this out, I am going to write the expected cost. So uh, what Epen does is that it uses the notation HI of Y, which denotes the expected shortage and back order costs in a given retailer I is defined as H sub uh, I of Y. So if I store all the way to Y, then if the demand is in between minus infinity and Y, well, I need to include this minus infinity business, although I know that the, if, if this condition is kept, the effect of that part is going to be negligible. Okay? So uh, when do I keep uh, stock uh, hold inventory? It will be H times Y minus X F I of X D X. So you see that if demand is less than Y, I'm going to have holding at the end of the period. So I'm going to charge this cost. Or otherwise, if demand exceeds the quantity that I have available, then I'm going to have back order. And let P be the back order cost per unit. So this is going to be X minus Y, Fi of X dx where Fi of x is the demand distribution, which is normal actually, but I wrote it as Fi of x. So this is the standard Newsboy argument, single period argument. Of course, this is the expected holding and inventory carrying cost that you pay every period. Now, as I am assuming that I am back ordering the demand, I am not going to include the effect of unit cost because it's always going to be the same. We always are going to satisfy the demand, which then the cost that we pay for the unit cost is going to be a constant. Okay. Now, the, the main trick which is done is to rearrange this uh, in equation two. If you look at the paper in equation two, okay, we are going to rearrange this term, and we obtain hi of y as hi minus h mu i, where mu i is the expected demand in retailer i, plus h plus p sigma i r y minus mu i divided by sigma i, where r of u is defined as the normal loss function. Okay? This is the function that I consider. I think yesterday, well, the day before we defined this as L, but now I'm, I'm following the notation of the paper, so this is R. So this is the L of Z we used before. Okay. Okay. So uh, this, is, this is actually what, what we have. Now, how did we wrote in this form? This is going to be one of the things that you will do in your homework, actually. So in your homework, you are expected to derive all these quantities when f of x is a normal distribution and when f of x is a general distribution. When it is a normal distribution, I want you to write all the terms in terms of the uh, standard normal function so that you can use tables or spreadsheet and so on to make the computations. Okay, so you might have some question marks, but this is very straightforward and easy to write. So that, that's the homework actually. Okay, now, uh, so if I write R of U, okay, uh, in, in terms of the 
standard normal function. This is the integral from u to infinity of w minus u, okay, 1 over square root of 2 pi e to the power minus w squared divided by 2 times dw. Now, what is this here? This is actually the standard normal density function. Okay? So, given this standard normal density function, I am simply computing the loss, the right-hand side tail, the expected number, uh, using this formula. Now, if we didn't have the standard loss function, this is actually the function that we call expected number of units not satisfied. Okay, so it's exactly the same thing. Because you are only considering the values that are beyond you, and so let's say that beyond you, you cannot satisfy. So this is simply expected number of units that you cannot satisfy. Okay, because it's, we're talking about numbers beyond you. Okay, so this is sort of the standard argument. Now you will see that when you start working with these type of functions, you can put it in a number of different forms. This form looks a little bit simpler because what you have here is you have a linear function of y here. Then uh, you have a, a, a value of y which is embedded in a certain integral. So you have y's uh, in two different uh, places. Okay. Now, let's, let's solve this problem. Let me define phi i of y as the cumulative uh, probability CDF. Let me write CDF. CDF of the demand. Note that this is the normal function, actually. Okay. So what is the optimality condition? If you recall, we can solve this. H is actually C O, P is C U in this case. So the optimality condition is such that at optimality, phi sub i of y should be equal to P divided by P plus H. Okay, this is the sort of C U divided by C O plus C U. This is exactly the same thing that we derived uh, on Tuesday. Now, what is interesting here is that, of course, as this distribution center is a, is, is a distribution system, is a system which has a single uh, owner. We are not given any information, but it's sort of the, the it's not a decentralized structure. Okay, so you, it is very reasonable to use the same penalty costs and the same holding costs throughout the system. There is no reason for using a different P and H value for different retailers if, if they all belong to the same company, okay? because it's the same thing. So in that case, you see that although demands may vary in different retailers, the fractal point is always going to be a constant. Because fractal point of the demand distribution is governed by the costs which are the same everywhere. So what's happening here is as follows. Let's say that we have two retailers. So let's call this retailer 1 and call this retailer 2. Now what I will do is on this axis we have y's, the order up to level, and for so this is going to be y1, this is going to be y2. Here I am going to have the CDF of i. Oh, this is CDF of 1, CDF of 2. Okay. One of them might be sort of, let's say that this is the point which is 1. One of them might be something like this. The other one might be something like this. I'm exaggerating now. I know that when it is normal, it's not going to be that different. So what this optimality condition simply tells us that if this is the value of P divided by P plus H, 
Okay, it is going to be constant in both of them. Of course, the implied quantity that we should order up to will be different. So this is going to be y1 star, and here this is going to be y2 star. Okay? But the fractal point is going to be the same. Any questions? Yeah, in other words, the uh, qu question is, is it, will it be possible to have a case where the cost will be different? Of course, yes. I mean, uh, categorically, I cannot say that they should be equal. But the, the issue here is the following. Uh, if you have a small place or a large place, still, I would expect that this is going to be equal as long as, as, long as what we are selling is a standard product plus uh, all the retailers have similar motivational factors to, uh, to simply uh, manage their uh, retailers and so on and so forth. In other words, if the managerial, uh, uh, managerial benefits given are different, depending on, for example, service level, then of course you are going to have P values different. But we're talking about the same company, and this is what I would expect. Of course, the <coughs> analysis is not going to change, even if you have different, but it's just going to be simple because we will be able to bring certain things together. But other than that, of course, it can be anything. But note that here, depending, with respect to the size, we are considering the size when we consider the CDF. The CDFs are not the same. In other words, one region might have more demand, the other region might have less demand. We are only suggesting that even if you have more demand or less demand, more variable demand or less variable demand, we're suggesting that if you lose the customer, the penalty cost that we pay is going to be the same. Okay? So, in other words, if you lose more, you're going to pay more cost, of course. Okay, any other comments or questions? Okay, now we can go one step further. So now, the optimal value, well, I showed it with star here, but the notation in the paper uses bars. So the optimal value, which is going to be yi bar, can be written in terms of mu i plus z, okay? And I'm going to call this z bar times sigma i, where z bar is the standard normal variant uh, cor that corresponds to p divided by p plus h fractile. So in standard normal, actually, uh, this is basically for a standard normal distribution, I'm talking about this specific z, okay, that has the cumulative function value p divided by p plus a. You can find this, of course, from the tables, okay? There are, I mean, you can find, easily find it from the table. So the idea here is that the order up to level is going to change according to the mean and the standard deviation of the demand. But the safety factor is always going to be the same because the costs are the same. Okay? So it's uh, exactly the same thing. Now I can write hi of yi bar. And when I do this, so what I will do is I am going to use this equation here. Now instead of y, I have a specific yi bar, which is the optimal point, and I'm going to evaluate this function at that yi bar. So when I do this, when I evaluate that function, uh, we, I'm going to obtain the following. I will have h z bar plus h plus p times r of z bar times sigma i. So what's happening is that, if you look at this carefully, the effect of mu is gone because of the 
normal distribution assumption. Now, if you compare this to, uh, I'll just bring it all the way up to here. Now, what, what I am doing is I'm, going, I'm replacing y with yi bar. So when you replace it, you see that this mu i term is going to cancel. So here, you have only h z bar left with sigma i. And then you have this term here. And this term is going to be constant any, anyway for, uh, well, this term is going to be constant because we, we have the same standard normal, this is standard normal distribution. And so what you have is, instead of y, I am going to place y i bar. So when you do that, mu i's are going to cancel. So you are going to have z bar sigma i divided by z bar. So you are going to have z bar here, which is going to be constant for all of them. So this is how we come up with this equation. So from here, we see that, actually, under these assumptions, I can rewrite this by writing this constant term. It's not a function of the retailer, but it's simply constant, and times sigma i. So the total, the expected inventory, and the expected inventory carrying cost and back order cost that we pay is a linear function of the standard deviation, okay? Which is actually something which is known. It's not something that's unknown, but this is going to be the case. But the interesting part is that this is still going to be the same if we have multiple retailers. Okay, now this is the typical analysis, and once we are done with this analysis, this is going to be the way that we are going to write our cost function. Okay, so now you see that this analysis is true if we have a single location where demand is normally distributed. We can rewrite everything in terms of this k times sigma i. Note that this is only holding and back order cost. It's, it, it doesn't contain anything else. Okay. So this part is okay. And now this is an, a, a generic analysis. In other words, I'm not sure about the size of, of any warehouse. But the only thing that I know is the demand is normally distributed. And that's it. Okay. Okay. Any questions on this? Now, what we are going to do is we are going to have two different extreme configurations. Okay, so the first configuration will be the centralized configuration. Now, what do I mean with centralized? I will assume a configuration where I don't have any retailers. I'm going to assume that all the demand that the retailers are seeing is now coming to the DC. So customers directly go to the DC. Okay. And the second case that we are going to analyze will be the completely decentralized case where each retailer operates uh, as if it is the only entity in the system. Okay. It doesn't care whether it has correlation of demand with the next retailer, so on and so forth, okay? So completely decentralized. What do we mean by completely decentralized? In practice, the way to describe completely decentralized structures is that you have two entities, they have no information regarding each other. And there is no, nobody who is trying to coordinate them, okay? So they are independent and they don't look anywhere else but only to their places, okay? So this is decentralized. Of course, if you are in the same company, a part of the same company, this is not going to be the case because you, you can get some information. On the other hand, if you are an independent person operating one of the retailers, this is going to be typic typically the case because you won't be granted information from the other retailers. Why should you? Well, you should, actually. That this is what we are going to learn in this course. You should, but uh, if you don't, this is going to be the other extreme. Note that we might have a solution in between, 
And that is something that we are going to look uh, in, I think, probably next week. Okay? Next week on Thursday. So, decentralized, we have only retailers. So, this, if given this, then what I will do is I will start uh, deriving the expected total cost that will incur in the centralized system and in the decentralized system and make comparisons. Okay, now let's start with the centralized system. So in the centralized system, now first what I have to do is I have to define the demand. So what is the demand for the centralized system? Well, you have, in the, uh, you have normally distributed random variables forming the demand for the retailers. So what I will do is uh, I will define xt as the total demand in the system. So how can I represent xt? xt is going to be the sum of the demand over all retailers. Okay? So now if you don't have any retailers, if, if everything is centralized, okay, then this is going to be the total demand that you see. You see, what I'm assuming is, I'm assuming that everybody is going to come and participate in the buying game, which is not going to be the case, of course, because it's no longer going to be convenient. We should always keep that in mind. Okay, now uh, here, let's assume that we have N retailers. Okay, so this is going to be simply the sum. So what can you say about the expected value of xt? It's simply going to be the sum of the expected values of xi's. How about variance of xt? It will be uh, uh, the variance of the sum of xi's. But now we, need, we have to be careful because we have, uh, where is that? Uh, well, we have some uh, correlation. Uh, and so we need to take that into account. But eventually what I can write is, I can write the following. xt is a normally distributed random variable. Some of normal di distributed random variables will still be normal. Okay? So xt is going to be normal with mean mu t and variance sigma t square, where mu t is simply summation of mu i, i from 1 to n. And sigma i, sigma t square is simply the, uh, the summation, oops, sorry. So summation of i from 1 to n, j from 1 to n of sigma i j. So what I did is I made a trick. Sigma i square, if you have double i, this, it means that sigma i i times sigma i i is what we defined as sigma i. So it will be simply variances. I can write this in different ways, but this is one way of writing it. This is simply i from 1 to n sigma i squared, plus you are going to have the rest of the terms, which is going to be the covariances. So how can I write the covariances? This is i from 1 to n, j greater than i. Okay, you take those two terms. So this is going to be 2 times j greater than i. And, well, let me, let me do this trick. So instead of having 2, let me write j not equal to i. Okay, so that it's only going to contain the terms which are not the variances. So I will have sigma i, sigma j, times rho ij. Okay, you remember this is the way that we define the correlation, and this is going to be the term that we are going to have. Excuse me? Yes, of course, I'm sorry. So we have uh, i, j, from 1 to n, and j is not equal to i. I should have two summations, actually. Okay, that would be better if I have two summations. So, uh, 
Now, if you want, let me define this term as V. Okay, just to make things a little bit simpler. Now, note that this V can be negative or this V can be positive. Okay, we don't have any limitations for the V value. Okay, so now uh, if I have the centralized system, I'm going to use the same ordering policy, of course, and with the same costs. So what will be my order up to level? My order up to level is then going to be, so I will, uh, let me uh, do the following. So uh, in this case, H, now remember I had H i's, now I'm going to write H centralized, so this is the total cost that I pay, uh, the total cost that I expected, uh, holding and shortage cost that I pay if I have the centralized system. So this is the uh, centralized systems holding and back order costs. So how can I write this? This is still going to be the K that I know, the same K that I derived because it's going to be constant regardless uh, what's going on. This k is still going to be the same. Z bar is still going to be the same. But I'm going to replace k i, uh, sigma i, excuse me, with sigma sub t. So this is going to be the only difference. Okay? So I will have sigma sub t rather than uh, sigma sub i. So everything else is going to be the same. And of course, well, let me write this y t bar, where y t bar is going to be mu t plus z bar times sigma t. Okay. Just uh, to write everything uh, completely. So this is going to be the cost that I'm going to pay. And how about the decentralized system? So let, let me say that uh, I defined the decentralized system. Okay. So the decentralized system, for the decentralized system, I have h i y i bars, which is simply k times sigma i. Now, if I sum over all i h i y i bars, then I'm going to obtain k times summation sigma i, i from 1 to n. Now, I don't have any other cost. These are the two costs that I have. So now, what I will do is I'm going to compare these two costs. So in order to do that, let me again use the notation which is used in the text, which is a repetition actually. He defines two different texts. So this is the total cost of the centralized system is given by k sigma t. Total cost of the decentralized system is given by k summation of sigma i. Now, question is, which one is larger? And how are we going to figure that out? Now, of course, I can immediately tell you that this is going to be smaller. OK. Always. Why? Well, we can see it from here. Now, what happens if you have full correlation? In other words, everything is fully correlated. In other words, the demand that you see in I has a correlation coefficient of 1 with the demand that you see in J. So if one of them is, let's say, at the 98th percentile, the other one is also going to be at the 98th percentile. Okay, fully correlated. So in that case, this is going to be 1. Okay, and of course, in order to understand what's going on, let us say that all the retailers are similar. 
Okay, so what you have is you have sigma i squared summed over i from 1 to n. And if it is fully correlated, you have another sigma squared here. How many of them do you have? How many do you have? Well, you are filling up a matrix, actually, okay, with everything. So the total number of sigma i squares that you have is capital N square. Okay, so what does this mean? If you take the square root, it's going to be capital N times sigma, which is going to be the cost that you have here, if all the sigmas are the same. But on the other hand, if it is not fully correlated, then we are going to have the first cost less. So let me show this uh, uh, using the equations that we have. So this is what we are going to show now. OK. So now I, let me write this TC. C, this is the centralized cost, as k times summation i from 1 to n sigma i squared plus 2 times summation i from 1 to n minus 1, j from 1, j from 2 to, uh, excuse me, i plus 1 to n because I have a 2 here, this is sigma i, sigma j, rho i, j. And I'm taking the square root of this. Or uh, using the notation that I already introduced, I call this v, if you recall. This is going to be k, square root of summation i from 1 to n of sigma i squared plus v. Okay. So this is actually the centralized cost. Now, what happens, what is the value of V? V is the correlation, okay, and some of uh, covariance terms. And we know that, if you recall, the smallest number, smallest value will be summation sigma i squared. Why? V should be greater than this value because if it is minus sigma i squared, then you are not going to have a variance. You cannot have a negative variance. So this is the smallest value that v can take. And what is the largest value that v can take is simply when the correlation coefficient is 1. So this is going to be summation i from 1 to n, summation j from i plus 1 to, this is n minus 1, this is n sigma i, sigma j. So I know that V is going to be a value in between these two. And we see that actually V is a, so uh, the smallest value of this TC cost is going to happen when V attains its lowest value. So TC C is going to be greater than or equal to 0. Note that if v is equal to minus sigma i squared, okay, we are going to have the total cost of the centralized system equal to 0. On the other hand, uh, TCC is going to be, if I attain the largest value, okay, uh, the largest value is going to be this one, or the, uh, k times square root of 2 times summation i from 1 to n minus 1, summation j from i plus 1 to n sigma i sigma j. Okay, so this is actually, we see that total cost of the centralized system can be anything in between. Okay, and Similarly, total cost of the decentralized system is simply k times i from 1 to n of sigma i. Okay. So this is actually what we have. And finally, uh, I'll make a comparison when sigma i 
is sigma i's are all identical. Easier term, let sigma i be equal to sigma. In other words, we have identical retailers or retailers with identical variances. Okay. In that case, the limit of TCC would be in between 0 and we have K and we, what do we have there? Plus sigma I square. Okay, this is what you were saying? Okay, good, correct. Okay. So in that case, this is going to be n square sigma I square, which is equal to k times n times sigma, and it turns out that this is equal to TCDD. So the largest value that the centralized cost can attain is uh, the decentralized system. Other than that, of course, it is going to be... Uh, so, uh, in general, actually, I can write TCC as the square root of K uh, Okay, no, this is, this is what we have. So, hence, TCC is always less than TCD. Okay, you can show it for more general cases as well because there is a certain upper limit that the covariance terms can get. Okay, so you can always show that actually the centralized cost is always going to be less. Now, uh, one other thing, if I have independent I, ID retailer demand, independent identical distributed retailer demand, then the sigma i, uh, rho ij's will be all equal to zero. So as a result, I would be able to write the centralized cost as k times square root of n times sigma. So you see that here, uh, compared to the decentralized system where I can write everything in terms of k n sigma, you see that the cost decreases using the square root of the number of retailers. In other words, if you have a decentralized system, you decided to centralize that system, everything is identical, the cost benefit that you are going to get is going to be uh, proportional to the square root of the number of retailers, which, is, which, is which might be pretty large. Okay. Of course, in this paper, what are we missing? We're missing the customer service. We're missing the existence of, uh, the, the, we are missing the, the reason for the existence of a distribution system. We don't have that, but it gives us a very important idea. The more you can centralize, the more it will be beneficial with respect to inventory holding. And we are going to keep in mind when we are dealing with more complicated system. Just let me give you one example. Uh, in different manufacturing sectors, you have a lot of common, spa uh, common parts. Let's say that you are manufacturing two different brands of refrigerator. You're, you're gonna, if you analyze those, uh, the, the parts that make up a refrigerator, you're gonna see that almost 90% of the parts are common. In other words, whether you are manufacturing refrigerator A or B, doesn't matter. Most of the parts that you use are common. And the main logic of common parts is actually the centralization issue. They are identical in terms of structure. Analytically, you can show that they are actually identical. Okay? In order to save from the safety inventory for different parts, you create common parts so that the usage is going to be more and diverse. Okay, so that's, that's the logic. And we're going to see that applied towards the end of the semester. Okay, any questions on this? Now I think we are ready to analyze, to study the first paper in the network design issue. 
Actually, we will be able to finish both of them, I think, next week on Tuesday. And because one of them is very easy to read, the first one by Nozick and Turnquist. The other one is a little bit more complicated, but I'll try to explain some details uh, in class. Any questions? Okay, have a nice weekend. I'll see you next week.